Welcome to my world. I'm yours, Kevin Rutherford. It is Friday, June 23rd. We are here live. It is a free for all. We're here for an hour this morning, and then we'll be heading over to Twitter Spaces for trucking trend de- technology and efficiency. I, I'm so stuck on what we used to call it. We should have kept it that name, I think. I'll get it one of these days. Uh, this first hour here is just a free for all. Anything goes, and uh, it is just an hour, so jump in and join us. Phone lines are open right now, 855 950 Still waiting to see if uh, who's joining us on Twitter Spaces. Uh, we'll be looking for Joel and Henry and Jamie and whoever. Uh, so we will see. One of the things we could talk about today, I kind of covered a lot of numbers yesterday. Atri, I was able to get um, their numbers from 2022. I went in and looked at the financials for the publicly traded, tends to be the larger carriers, looked at their numbers for 2022. Really interesting stuff. Numbers are just all over the board. Um, and, And we... The topic we may start talking about today on the space will be alternatives to driver pay under our current model. What could we change to improve a couple of things in the industry, driver turnover being the big one? Um, Whether or not we have a driver shortage to me is completely meaningless. I, I really don't even understand why we spend so much time arguing whether there's a shortage or not. But if we want to address turnover, which would have an impact on shortage if there is one, uh, what could we do to improve that? And at the same time, could we improve safety? So we've talked about what about paying drivers by the hour. I really think we'll, the best pay system may be a hybrid system. And this is really what I had with my drivers. My drivers got paid by the mile. They knew exactly how much they were going to make every week because they got the same number of miles. It was dedicated runs. Above and beyond their mileage pay, they had an hourly pay system. Anything after the first hour that was not their fault that delayed them, I paid them by the hour. So if they got stuck in traffic, if the if they're, we did what we called butt heads, my drivers left one terminal, went to a meeting location, met a contractor coming out of another terminal, swap trailers, and everybody went back home. If that meetup was delayed more than an hour, because the first hour's lunch anyway, if that meetup was delayed more than an hour, then they went on the clock. If it was a traffic accident and held them up or traffic for any reason, construction, whatever, after the first hour, they were on the clock. That's not an easy system for a large fleet to implement. A a lot of these alternative pay methods, hourly, hybrid, whatever, won't be easy. And here's the other thing we have to remember. This has got to be based in numbers. The trucking industry had a good year in 2022, but it wasn't as good as I expected it to be when I actually looked at all of their numbers. They are still in single digits for profit margins. So when you look at the numbers and you say, well, we just need to pay drivers more. Well, that's not going to be all that easy. There isn't more money to pay them. Large trucking companies have huge capital outputs. They have lots of risk and they don't have a lot of margin. They did increase driver pay significantly over the last couple of years. And that's why even with the higher rates, their their margins and their profitability was not what I expected it to be. They It's still, like I said, single digits, less than 10% profit margins. That's a tough business to run. Capital intensive, lots of equipment. Your biggest cost or one of your biggest costs, fuel all over the board and Driver pay, if you look at it, if most of these fleets were just to increase driver pay by a couple cents, it would wipe out their margins. So if we switch to another method, it it can't really pay them more. It could only pay them different. There isn't more money there. Rates would have to go up. It's, uh, It's not an easy... Now, 
here's another topic we could throw out that I think would be easier to implement, not easy, but easier. And I think it would have a bigger impact on turnover. I think we need the, the industry, large carriers, whoever, we need to start working towards getting drivers home more often. That solves this problem virtually every time. Uh, my operation was that way. I had no issues with drivers whatsoever. Talk to other people. The key is getting them home more often. Small carriers have more control over this sometimes, I think. Choose different freight. Choose out and back more regional kind of freight. Get them home every couple of days. Get them home every weekend. You see a huge change in turnover when you can do that. All right, calls are starting to come in, so we're just going to get to them. Today is about you, so let's get started in South Carolina today. Dave, welcome to the program. Yeah, I just I have a question about the cardio miracle, but I got a comment on the on the wait time and the you know companies paying you hourly, and you said it's pretty difficult to do that. Well, I work for the largest retailer in the country, and when we go to a a vendor, a store, a DC, and you hit arrive. On that computer, it starts calculating your time. After 45 minutes, it starts paying you automatically. That's how it works for this company. But Yeah, and um, it, I'm assuming it, it's Walmart. Yeah, you'd yeah. be right. So, and I'm home every five days. Yeah. Now, the home every five days is big, but here's the issue with pay and why we can't really use Walmart as an example. The problem is Walmart's not a trucking company. They're a private retailer. They they don't have to deal with their margins are not what margins in trucking companies are. Their their revenue is not. Yeah, but it, the, it, it, yeah. Hold on. It's not the same. Right. Trucking companies only generate revenue by moving freight. And there's only so much margin there. Re, private carriers have always paid more and had better benefits because they have profit right. other than just moving freight. They don't profit by moving freight. They save money by moving their own freight. They are all, private carriers have always been able to pay better. And and again, it's because they have yeah. a whole different profit setup. They're not just making money right. on moving freight. In fact, they don't make money on moving freight. They lower their expenses by moving freight. Right. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, they are a separate entity of that. It's a separate, you know, it's Walmart Transportation, LLC. But anyway, they, we do move our own freight. Um, as far as a cardio miracle, do you know if that, I assume it's for cardio health and like blood pressure, that type thing. Do you know if there's any adverse reactions with taking that with when you take Coumadin? Uh, a little bit, I think, because of the vitamin K that's in there. Uh, but it's okay. not a, not All enough right. yeah. to be a big deal. Right, right. Yeah, I could just adjust it, my Coumadin. Um, yeah, now the, yeah, and the only the, reason I take the, that is because I have a mechanical heart valve. So. I was just going to ask, is there a, a, a definite yeah. medical re? Well, you know what? I would still check this. Yeah, I, I I would do some sort of a consult with like Dr. Wolfson and just make sure that that's really true. That just because you have that valve, you have to be on a blood thinner. I, I'm not. I don't know that that's true. I would want to verify that. Well, this one, yeah, I I think I talked to him when he was on there one time, and the, the mechanical valve, yeah, you do. If it's a pig valve, no, you don't. And it's not a real. I mean, I'm at a low range. Since I've had the surgery, you know, they've lowered the range. So it's not like it's when I hit my arm, I bruise myself or anything. So, but I guess because that mechanical valve, they would have a tendency to possibly clot around that valve because it's not a natural material. That's what I was told by the surgeon. So. No, I, I get that. But, but here, here's the thing. They, they, they push pharmaceuticals. There's no doubt. There are tons and tons oh, of yeah, people yeah, on yeah. lots of oh, yeah. So all I'm saying is let's, double check this and if you are at that low of a of a dose well maybe it's not necessary at all again i don't know that answer that's yeah. a medical issue but if i were in that position right. i would want a, at least a second or third opinion on that right yeah i mean i don't really want to take it i mean i don't i don't have heart disease or anything i just had a bad valve when i was born and it right. just hit me when i was 56 right. years old so i had to have it replaced but 
Yeah, I mean, I don't take anything else, blood pressure or none of that. But and I really don't wouldn't want to take this. But my two options were the pig valve or the mechanical valve. And being in my age, this mechanical valve is supposed to last till I die. Where a pig valve, you have to have it redone in ten to fifteen years. Got and it. Okay. I didn't really want to do that, so no. that's why I went that route. Yeah, that makes sense. So, anyway, all right, I'll, I'll check it out. Uh, I, like I say, I do eat a little stuff with vitamin K, but I'm I'm basically uh, meat and potatoes. That's what I grew up on: meat, potatoes, vegetables. That's it. That's how I was grew, grew up, and I'm six <laughs> six, two hundred and ten pounds, and that's the weight I've been for. 20 years 25 years i i go up five go down five yeah, right so, right you know um, yeah yeah the, the cardio right, miracle I'll helps a lot it really does and and that that little bit of k yeah, just with everything matter. right 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 okay all right kevin thanks you're welcome thanks for the call let's go to oh wait a minute Looks like we've got some guests in here. Let me, uh, I'm just going to bring everybody in at the same time so we can start talking over each other. Good morning, guys. Uh, hey, morning, how's it Kevin? going? Hey there. Uh, well, I'm glad you guys uh, showed up. I wasn't sure what was going on today. Um, it's kind of a free-for-all in this first hour, but we can certainly, I, I threw out the topic of driver pay. I think that's what we said we might focus on a little bit um, this week. I got some numbers. Um Atri's numbers are out. I was actually um, a little shocked to see how much driver pay has increased. I know it's been going up, but I, I really didn't think it was this big. Let me get to these numbers. Um, so I went back to uh, 2013. Uh, Atri's got a chart here, shows 2013 to 2022 and they break down motor carrier costs. There was some really interesting stuff in here. So let's just start at the top. So in 2013, the fuel cost per mile average across these fleets was 64 cents a mile. In 2022, the fuel cost per mile, 64 cents a mile. It's exactly the same as what it is in 2013, which is kind of odd because in between there, it was all over the board. It was uh, 58 cents, then 40 cents, then 33 cents, then 36, then 43, then 38. In 2020, it was only 30 cents a mile. And in 2022, it was 64. That just points out how volatile our fuel costs are. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, uh, fuel prices are always all over the board, obviously, and why we have fuel surcharge. But it is a little surprising that it swung that much. Uh, but uh, it, that is one of the key considerations, I guess, when we're talking about driver pay, trying to you know keep fuel prices under control or stable so we can have a nice platform in order to base the driver pay off of is always helpful for a business, I guess. Yeah, it would be. So let's look at some of these other numbers because I was pretty surprised. If we, again, we'll, we're, we'll compare 2013 to 2022. So um, equipment payments, whether it's purchase or lease, in 2013 accounted for 16 cents per mile. In 2022, it's 33 cents a mile. That's a pretty significant increase in nine years. And That's I'm dumb. assuming... I'm assuming a lot of that's been driven by the new, you know, the updated EPA regulations. It's getting more expensive to, yep. to yep. build the trucks due to the new technology that's required. And, and then in 2022, and, and the trucks we on were, average. Uh, go ahead, Henry. The trucks on average are more luxuri l bleh, yeah. luxurious than they were. Good point. Back then, too, even in yeah. the fleets, they've up, up their game. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the other thing that probably had that's, an impact in 2022 is interest rates starting to go up. Sure. So, yeah, uh, interest rates. I think what, what, what Henry's touching on, though, he's exactly right as far as fleets trying to attract and retain drivers. I mean, now we don't have one refrigerator. We're putting two refrigerators in trucks. We're, we're putting on... Um, air conditioning systems, uh, electric parking air conditioning systems, yeah. or traditional APUs. Over. It seems like all fleets have them. Um, you know, options like the dynamic steering that, that Volvo has out that is purely a luxury item. It's nice to have. 
not required, but lots of fleets are specking that. So that does have a big impact on the cost of the truck, obviously. Yes. So next one, repairs and maintenance. 2013, the cost was 15 cents a mile. In 2022, it is 20 cents a mile. I I really expected a bigger increase there. I was a little shocked at how it's that, well, closer the, the than I thought. Labor it rates been. have gone up. I know. But one one thing I think at play here is actually with the new technology, the trucks are becoming more and more reliable. Yeah, good point. And then um, the, we're seeing the increase in costs mostly because of increased in the labor costs in the shop and right. whatnot. I, I, that's but, my, my personal thought there. So yeah, um, higher hourly costs. We did kind of off, offset breakdowns. that. Yes. Yeah. yeah that would make yeah, sense. Correct. Look, look, look yeah. at the, the oil change intervals, uh, which would be part of it. I mean, mine's out at ah, that's another good point. Right. Five thousand. Right. Yeah, so that one, I, I was a little pleasantly surprised that that that's not, I, I think that's just a kind of a normal increase in the cost of doing business. I don't see that as being a big burden, really. Insurance premiums went up well, a couple and, cents, uh, two cents. I don't see that as any big deal either. No, and that is kind of surprising, too, when you consider the amount of miles that we're actually running and the amount of trucks on the road. I think that actually speaks well to the new technology that everybody loves to seem to hate <laughs> is in terms of the radar systems and the braking and, and whatnot. I, I think it's doing its job. Otherwise, we would probably see bigger year-over-year -year, uh, increase in insurance costs if that stuff wasn't working. Especially with the nuclear verdicts factored exactly. into that. Exactly. Right. Right. Um, permits and license, not a big deal, but it actually went down uh, from two and a half cents a mile to one and a half cents a mile. Don't know why, uh, but it did. Not a big deal. Here's one that I was really shocked by because I have been saying for the last nine years or so, my God, every time I look at tires, they just keep getting more expensive, except they don't. Cost per mile for tires in 2013 was four cents a mile. Cost per mile in 2022 is four cents a mile. It didn't change. So the tires have to be lasting well, that, longer. Yeah. 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 That Plus, back surprise. in 2000, I used to figure on five cents a mile is what I figured yeah, on ahead of time were, budgeting form. Yeah. You were right there. And that um, really hasn't changed. So one of the things that I'm looking at here as I'm doing the testing with the, the Michelin wide base, and of course, you know that I'm not a huge fan of the wide base tires, but I, I've got to tell you, they've done a hell of a job improving <laughs> the tire. It's definitely lasting so. longer. It's wearing better. So even though that tire is probably more expensive, obviously, than just a few years ago, it's definitely going to have a longer lifespan and it's going to drive the cost per mile down. And And, you know, I think a lot of people that are, they're having, you know, fits about everything costing so much and being expensive, which it is. There's no doubt prices are going up. Stuff is getting dramatically better. We're more fuel efficient. Service <laughs> intervals are longer. Our tires are lasting longer. Brakes are lasting longer. So it's, it's not all bad news. It may look that way just looking at the price of stuff. But when you huh. actually have your hands on this new tech and you're using it, it's actually quite good. I, I agree. And that's why I wanted to get these numbers out there and start talking about them, because it's not all doom and gloom, not even close. Here's something else I take away from this. If the cost per mile for tires is only four cents a mile and it's been four cents a mile for a decade or longer, this isn't a place where I would be looking to save money. You're, there's not much here to save. I think this is telling me I should be buying premium tires. I agree. I it, agree. I agree a hundred percent with yeah, that. It, it, I what? remember one time that I lost two tires and bought one of the cheaper tires because the other ones were wore down and it matched right. 30 seconds wise. Yeah. But I ended up having to take them off before because they wore out almost twice as fast. That that's I think the lesson here is look, if this is only four cents a mile anyway, buying cheaper tires, what is it gonna maybe save you a penny, but it could end up costing you even more. So this is an area where I would say don't try to cheap out on tires. Find the the best tire that works in your operation and stick with it. Yeah, I think Absolutely. this is a classic e example of yeah. the free market at work. Um several years ago. 
my brother's fleet, we noticed that some of the mid-tier tires were actually getting very, very good. And That's they were correct. kind of challenging yeah. the top tier brands in terms of longevity. Well, now we're seeing the top tier brands go back, do their homework, and <laughs> right. now they're starting to last a little yeah. bit longer again. So, you know, that's a, that's that's just competition at work, and and it, it shows that it works right here because that cost has stayed flat over several years, and even with the price of the tire going up. So it, I, it's all good. And you know what? Uh, the, and, the, and Kevin. We, uh, go ahead, Henry. With, uh, going with the premium tire. You know, if you don't have the truck lined up right or anything, that's where the real important emphasis ah, is. Good point. Yeah. Using a good yep. alignment system like Mike Beckett. Because no matter how good the tire is, if it's not lined up right, and oh. when I work with fleets, yeah. that's one of the first things I do. we got to have the tires pointed in the right direction because that's where the rubber meets the road. And here's the other thing we identified. And, and, you know, Joel, what you just talked about, Mike Beckett's been talking about for several years. He was saying, look, and he was always kind of a first top tier tire guy. And he said, it's not necessary anymore. That This next second tier has improved so much. Now, I think, like you said, we're seeing that change again. Companies went back and, and put, you know, R&D money into tires and, and they're making a better premium tire now. But, and again, it doesn't have to be all that premium. There, there's so little cost here in tires that, that this isn't a place where you should try to save any money. You just buy a good tire, spend the money. It seems to be well worth it. I think that's and, true for the owner operator. The, the premium top tier brand is probably your most economical uh, way to go. Uh, you know, some of the fleets may be different that right. buy in volume right. and they can work with some of the, the, the good second tier brands that like, you know, like my brother does and they get a heck of a discount on things and, and whatnot. But for the majority of owner operators, uh, you know, unless you have experience with a particular second tier brand that works very well in your operation, you know, I, I would definitely be looking at a Michelin or a Bridgestone uh, and you're probably going to get the best uh, results out of those. Now, here's an interesting the, number. The other thing, Kevin, on uh, that, a lot, a, lot, a lot of your Tier 2 tires are actually the older design of the premium yeah, that's, tire. That's a good point. You're right. Yeah. Sometimes they bring out a new so, line, so and then their, big, the old one becomes their second tier, or they just move the technology yeah. down. And a lot of these tire companies, it's like everything else. A lot of them are owned by the same parent company. It's hard to keep track of them yeah. anymore, who owns what. But Michelin owns a ton of second-tier brands. Yeah, right. that's, that is so true. Good that is very true. Bridge, Bridgestone, same way. Uh, right, exactly. There's only really a couple tire manufacturers out there. that They, they, they own all the brands, it, and that's common across everything. We were talking about it the other day with coolant and uh, all kinds of things. So uh, here here was an interesting right. number. If we want to talk about driver pay, I was actually shocked by this. And I, I posted the number. Somebody's already questioning him, saying that's way too high. Where did they ever come up with that? I, I don't know. But here's what Atri, these are Atri's numbers taken from fleets and then averaged or they're using a, I can't remember on this one if they're using an, oh, no, it's average marginal cost per mile. So in 2013, driver wages were 44 cents a mile and driver benefits added another 13 cents. So wages and benefits, it was costing the fleet 57 cents a mile for a driver. In 2022, driver wages. Set, that, oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. That would be about right. Okay. That, uh, that would be about right. You know. Now listen to this. I was shocked by this. If it's accurate. And, and I have to believe it's as accurate as it was in 2013. They haven't changed their methodology. So even if this isn't indicative of the entire industry, it's the carriers they surveyed, it still tells you the trend and the trend shouldn't change much across the industry. And here's what it is. Driver wages in 2022 went from 44 cents a mile to 72 cents a mile. Benefits went from 13 cents a mile to 18 cents a mile. So it's now a total of 90 cents a mile for a driver. That's a big increase. That's, that is most likely correct. I, I, I mean, um, again, 
using my brother's fleet as kind of as my benchmark that because I understand the operation and what's going on internally. It's a huge struggle. Uh, the driver wage thing is, has really gotten crazy. And, you know, they knew when they raised rates initially that, you know, if the market turns down, we're going to have to be ultra, ultra efficient to survive because where's the money going to come from? You can't take wages away or it's very difficult to do that. So um, that number, I think, is probably pretty I, I, darn accurate. I thought I so, too. It sound high to a lot of people, but the cost of benefits is crazy. I mean, it, oh, it is. Yeah, it's, benefits. it's just nuts. So um, I, I think those numbers are, are pretty spot on, really. So if they are. Nothing. So over a, almost a decade, nine years, we saw this big increase. I, 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 I'd challenge anybody to find another industry that increased wages this much in nine years. I, I don't think there are many out there. It didn't make a dent in turnover or driver shortage or whatever we want to claim is happening. Uh, it didn't really change. And, and look, it, maybe it doesn't have to change completely overnight or even in nine years with these numbers. But if you're trying something that everybody said should work, there's no shortage. Just pay them more. Well, we're paying them more and nothing changed. It didn't even budge. Well, maybe this isn't the answer. And, and I think a better answer on it. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have driver increases and, and pay should be up. That, that's fine. But th- it may not solve the issue everybody thinks it's going to solve. I, one of the things I think I, would have a you bigger know, I, impact is figure out how to get drivers home more often. Quality of life. No, you're, yes, you're exactly right. There, there is a huge quality of life issue, and, and it is a combination of not only pay but how they're compensated and then the quality of life. And, and let's face it, for most people, being out on the road for a month at a time just completely sucks no matter what you're it does. Most people, I mean, they just don't want to do that. Now, there's there's some goofy people like me that love it, but that's or, the it, exception and not, not the rule is. for sure. Or, you know, people who are single. If I were single, I, I'd love, screw having a house or an apartment. I'll go live in a truck, drive and make money and stay at Airbnbs when I want to. I mean, I, I think that would be awesome. Um, or a husband and wife team. I, I think those are some exceptions and, and that's fine. Why don't we... We recruit more people like that to handle the big line haul long stuff. But why not start building a system in between somewhere with more relays and, and interlining and, and let's get drivers home more often. Well, well that's what it, I could never it, figure out with this day and age of computers and everything else that some of these big fleets with what you're saying, interlining and hub and spoking and everything, they could get a large portion of them home almost every day. Uh, yeah, I think so. You, you, you can, but the problem is when you start to do multiple relays, cargo swap, cross docking, all that stuff starts to get really expensive as, as well. You're adding another layer of cost. You have to have more trailers and equipment in order to do the types of things you're talking about. And, you know, you still have to so, remain competitive. So that is that is very difficult. It definitely needs to be worked on, that aspect of things. Um, there, there are multiple things at play here. It is it is so, pay to a certain degree, but not just pay. It's how we're compensated. Um, it's, again, you know, using the maybe AI and all, all types of other, you know, computer um software in order to really start to optimize the movement of freight. One thing I have noticed that running a lot of loads here lately for Schneider, which obviously is a huge company, um, it's kind of comical. They're kind of lost at times where their trailers are at, where their freight's going and who's (laughs) where. It's very difficult to keep track of that many trucks and trailers and shippers. It is not an easy task. It takes a heck of a lot of computing power so when I compare my brother's fleet to Schneider, it's it's a night and day difference in terms of actually knowing where the trailers are, where the drivers at, how many hours they have available, when they need to get home. You know, the bigger the operation, oh, it's a big deal. Yeah, which no benefits doubt. from economies of scale. Oh, well, Joe, they lose the ability to efficiently manage at a at a small level to do the types of things we're talking about. And, and Joel, it's you know this this leads right into where we've talked about before with 
there's the lack of a career path to a certain degree. And in along with that, you know, that certain act that had to do with that nice, cool, refreshing drink. That, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which I'll let you bring that up, Kevin. So, Rick, yeah. So, <laughs> it's every time I bring it up. <laughs> so, really, what what we're saying when we look at alternatives, hourly, a hybrid, mileage hourly, getting drivers home more often, what we're saying, there's no quick, easy answer to this. And part of the problem is, I, not only did I look at the operational numbers from Atri, I went in and looked at all the financials from the publicly traded carriers. And they they've had a couple of good years. And they should have. We had good rates. Um, They deserved a couple of good years. But it's not as good as what I would have hoped because expenses went up so much. Their their profit margins are still in single digits. I mean, this is a tough industry. You look at the capital outlay you've got in equipment. You look at the risk you've got in insurance and liability. And then to think that the best you're going to hope for is single digit profit margins. That where is the money to change you know, any of this? Kevin, you know, during tough. that, up, uh, go ahead. It, it's it's extremely tough industry. It's very cutthroat. It's a race to the bottom, and you know, it, and it's not just all the things we talk about. Now let's throw the safety aspect and the the driver lifespan and how unhealthy the industry is, in on top of it. So you've got all those issues as the driver pool starts to age out. It becomes a huge problem. You know, how many truck drivers over 50 have, you know, have have diabetes, are overweight, you know, have sleep apnea, have all kinds of of health issues. And and, um, when your most skilled assets are sick all the time, that doesn't bode well for the industry either. So you have to you have to throw that in on top of it. You're absolutely and, right. And it's, Somebody it's posted. It's not an easy lifestyle. No, no, absolutely. And that's part of what we should work towards trying to make it a little bit easier of a lifestyle. That that could go a long way in a lot of these things as well. Somebody posted. I guess they found a statistic. I want to go look at this. That um, drivers with type two diabetes were a hundred and seventy six percent more likely to have an accident. And and you know, right before somebody posted that. We, I was debating safety and pay with somebody and they said, you know, they brought up safety. And I, I said, look, I, I really can't speak intelligently about safety. It's not an issue I pay a lot of attention to. It's not something I focus on or think about. So if you're looking for answers for safety, not my ball of wax, I, you know. And then the next thing I know, somebody posted that and I'm like, look, I, I've contributed a ton to safety. I cure drivers of diabetes every day. Yeah, the other uh, thing I you agree. were talking about during that upturn, what people were willing to pay for equipment was insane. Oh, I knew gosh. of one fleet that was selling nine-year-old trailers for more than they paid for them. You know, you, you knew that when things turned around on that, that that was going to have to be a piper was going to get paid in the end of that. It, it, we've been saying that for a couple of years. That that I, I was saying, I feel sorry for fleets that they have to raise pay, they have to, you know, exchange trucks, they can put it off for a little while. But they, they Joel, you know, that they build their whole business around trade-in cycles. That's a big deal. And, and to try to yeah, change yeah, absolutely. it, to try to change it at the end of the cycle, because prices are up and interest rates are up, they were in a tough position. They had to raise driver pay. I was saying all throughout this, I don't know what's going to happen to some of these fleets when the crash occurs, because they're going to be hurting. So fundamentally, when you look at this, the to me, the, the base problem and curse, it's both, is the entire transportation system is built on productivity, period. And, of course, the big businesses love that part of it. It's not good for the guy behind the wheel at all. In fact, it's bad for the guy behind the wheel. And, you know, safety, regardless of what everybody preaches, it takes a second seat to productivity. It always has. Yep. And until that dynamic flips around, nothing's going to change. It's just not. And no. as much as I hate government regulation and governments you know, stepping into things, it will require the government to do this because corporations don't give a damn about safety in the drug. No, 
They right. just don't. It is right. productivity, productivity, productivity. And it's going to implode upon itself at some point, you know, who, who knows when. Uh, you know, I think we're seeing some of that with the struggles that we're facing, and, and that's only going to get worse. You know, a- until we put safety at the top of the list and actually do it, I don't think things are going to get better no matter what we do. You, you, we see how complicated this problem is, and this you know, striving for productivity just further complicates that. And, you know, I get it from a business standpoint. We have to be productive, but by the same token, we can't kill our damn drivers off. And that's essentially well, what we're doing. Yeah. I well, agree. Joel, you know, when you say that, one of the most obvious areas on that, if safety was at the top of the list, when there was snow, you wouldn't hardly see a truck. Yeah. People, people knew to shut down well, and well, well, that just well, doesn't happen today. Well, well, here's another one. Do we really think it's smart for trucks to be doing 80 miles an hour? That's not safe. I, listen, I, I, I 100% agree you think with that you. Is not you know, safe. I do some in testing out at, out, at, out at that speed, you know, and, and I know Henry does some testing out at those speeds, but is it safe? I, you know, you, you cannot prove where, where speed actually impacts the frequency of an accident, but it absolutely always impacts the outcome. The outcome is always going to be worse if you have oh, yeah. an accident. That's an absolute. And we're seeing no that doubt. with these mega pileups. Right. When we had 55 mile an hour speed limits, you never heard of a mega pileup. They just didn't happen because you had so much time to react regardless of the weather conditions. Well, now we've got guys running 75 and 80 out across Wyoming with a 40 mile an hour broadside wind and snow on the road. <laughs> yeah. And they're on the CB going, you ain't a trucker. You don't know how to drive in the snow. I, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's oh yeah. I heard one guy on that the other day. It was raining that you couldn't hardly see the end of your hood. And, and, and yeah. Is everybody slowing down? Can't you drive in the rain? It's like you yeah, can't see yeah, you're the, the problem. Your hood. <laughs> well, you know the 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 number. I believe it's still true. I haven't looked it up in a couple of years. But the number one accident in trucking is is rear end collisions. Right? If speed isn't a factor in that, what is? That speed is the single most important factor to whether you're going to run into somebody in front of you or not. And and, well, and that is what, following distance. Well, right. Well, right. following it, it, distance, speed, it's it, all interrelated. Right. And this yeah. is why guys hate radar systems on their truck, because that radar is truthful. And it tells <laughs> you, hey, you're just going too fast. Oh, bullshit, so, I can see in front of you. You can see that gap, but you cannot time it as a driver. As a human being, we cannot time gap like radar can. And guys, absolutely, I let the computer drive my truck. This is the one area where the computer is absolutely more accurate than we'll ever be. Yep. And you know By we far. don't we don't trust it, and and right. yeah, it's crazy. The, when it, when I had that <laughs> well, that's system in we're my after truck, productivity. Every yeah, when I had that system in my truck, every time a new got, driver got in the truck, if they would call me and start complaining about the system, the first thing I would say is, I guess we need to do a little driver retraining. If that system is going off constantly, we've got a problem. I've driven that truck. It does not go off constantly. When it does, it's telling you something, no, it, and you should listen to it. You're, you're driving right. Yes. The other, the other part about this, Kevin, and we've talked about this, and this relates to safety, driver pay, and everything. If we slowed every truck down on the road, capacity tightens up, rates ah, go yes, up, yes, it drives fuel yes. economy numbers up, it, and your maintenance costs go down. So all the numbers you just talked about, if tomorrow we flip the switch yeah. and everybody went 55, maintenance is going down, tire cost is going down, Insurance. driver's wages go up, rates go up, everything gets better. I agree. But people just refuse to see that. Everything gets better. It, I, well, that's the same way with hours of service. The more flexibility we have, the less we're worth. Yeah, no, you're exactly <laughs> right. Flexibility is just, you know, kicking kicking us right in the ass. Yeah, flexibility. Oh, wink, yeah. wink. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, make it uh-huh. less flexible. My time, you know, if, if you cut me down to... I could only work eight hours a day. My eight's worth what 14 is now. So, yeah. It, and if, yes, we, if yes, we think absolutely. about this, if we think about this, trying to convince company drivers who are strictly paid by the mile 
and slowing down offers them no real benefit immediately. Even if we try to convince them, look, if we could get every driver on the road to slow down, everything would get better. Rates would go up. Fuel costs would go down. Yeah. All these, it would all be better. I understand why a company driver is going to say, well, screw that. I can't wait two years for that to no, happen you're, while, and, while and my this, pay goes down. But this is why I focus on owner operators. Owner operators can get an immediate well, benefit from doing this. And if we do enough of it, it could start to impact the industry. Owner operators are, are the absolute key to this. Unfortunately, they think that this somehow, the physics somehow favor mega companies and doesn't apply to them and that they're oh, more profitable yeah. when they, when they drive oh, fast or oh. not really understanding the difference between top line revenue and bottom line savings, Let, which is a huge problem. Also, this is where the government kind of needs to step in and say, if you're going to pay a company driver, you have to value their time in some way and not pay by the mile. I agree. So here's Problem a great solved. example. Slow the trucks down, uh, uh, attach time value to the driver's pay, and you know, let's educate the owner operators a little bit more, and um, a lot of things turn around in a hurry. Yeah, let, here's an example. And I think it's, it's just one truck. It's an anecdotal evidence, but it's it's I think there's a lot more of this. So Matt has always been generous in sharing all of his numbers with us. He lets us put post them online. We talk about them on the air. I think Matt's a great example. He's a single truck with his own authority, with trailer cost. He's got direct customers. It's a good comparison of one truck really managed well, but in the same kind of environment that a fleet has. He has the higher insurance costs. He's got his cost of of having authority. He's got all those same costs, trailer costs, everything. So Atria is now claiming with driver pay, we we broke $2 a mile for a cost now, first time ever. And it didn't just break $2 a mile a little it's two dollars and twenty five cents a mile now. That's what Atri is claiming the cost to move freight per mile. So we looked at Matt's mm-hmm. numbers and we we put in ninety cents a mile for Matt's pay and benefits. So we are comparing apples to apples here. Matt is not at two twenty five a mile. He's at a dollar eighty one a mile. That's significantly different. Yeah, no, you're you're uh, you're a hundred percent right on that. I, I think what it would do is we we need to manage our operations better, and really what we're talking about slowing down and tightening capacity. Uh, for whatever reason, owner operators are convinced that that benefits mega fleets when it's just the exact opposite. Right. Mega oh, fleets yeah, yeah, always do everything on economies of scale. Very rarely do they operate on an efficiency model. Correct. Owner operators always have to operate on an efficiency model because they can't buy in volume. So when we slow the speed down and become more efficient, who's it going to benefit? The reality is, is that the big mega fleets are back giggling at these guys exactly. that want to run 75 miles. They love it. Yes, they, they do. absolutely love it. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you know that needs to really, we really need to to really push that message out there and and show people why that is and how it works. And it's, it's just a fact though. Nobody wants to believe that for whatever reason, we're addicted to speed. Obviously it's kind of like a drug. I don't know if the, (laughs) if it affects your hormones or what it does, but it's addictive. There's, there's no doubt it's addictive. And um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, I just, just looked at the. We need more education. <laughs> I just looked at the clock. We've got to grab some howdy. calls here. Paul, what's on your mind? How, howdy, numbers. Um, my ugly ass car carrier aerodynamically challenged. I'm at fifty nine cents a mile for fuel. That's I, after my discount. That's crazy because the mega carriers with vans that you know a van is about our best opportunity to get maximum fuel economy. They're spending more on fuel than you are. That that's a pretty uh, yeah. awful. Statistic, really. Yeah, well, maybe I should add my Honda generator fuel in there. That would bump it up a little bit because <laughs> I don't. So I don't because I don't have I don't idle overnight. So yeah, my hot. I don't I don't need a six hundred and seventy five horsepower but, air conditioner 
when a Honda will do it. <laughs> so here, here's yeah. an example of really focusing on our biggest cost and what can be done. And and I get it. Fleets don't have this kind of advantage. Fleets are never going to be able to put out these kind of numbers in fuel economy. Owner operators can and should. And, and it's, I'm always shocked when they don't focus on this. This is their biggest advantage. I, I hear all this whining all the time. We can't compete with big fleets. They're hiring all these foreign drivers and paying oh. them next to nothing. Oh. And, and they get oh. such huge discounts. And, and, and no, they don't. I'm looking at the numbers and this shouldn't even be close. Owner operators no. should be kicking their ass when it comes to cost and profitability. Yeah. Well, I think big fleets are the easiest to compete with is what I found. Exactly. Over the it's the small carriers that, that they'll, they'll, they'll clean my clock because they usually give really good service, but they're not good enough about charging the rate they needed to. Oh, absolutely. Up until, up until the middle of May, up until the middle of May, my maintenance was about 21 cents. That's for truck and trailer. But then May, when I broke down and had the knock sensor and wiring harness and all that other crap, and then I put new front springs in, well, that jumped me up considerably. I'm up to about 38 cents a mile for maintenance that, this year. That, that maintenance is always it's a kind tough of a one. A little folk. Um, yeah, maintenance yeah. is always tough it, because it, you've got to look at the longer picture. I also have to believe maintenance on a car hauler trailer is, is quite a bit more than a van. Yeah, well, yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll went to the shop one day. The uh oh, Paul, where'd he go? Oh, I think we he, we just lost the call completely. Let's uh, let's go to New Mexico. Rusty, welcome. Hey, yep, I'm calling back on the DD13 that we were talking about uh, a couple of days ago. There you go. Um, Let, let's talk ask about Henry. specking one. Yeah. Yeah. Henry, I'm what I want to spec a duty 13 to pull a rib side at 53 foot 13, six that I haul 84,000, uh, load, kind of loaded both ways. It's a regional operation. I'm on the highway 95% of the time, but got some really tough, uh, tough pulls backing up and going forward out of fields and, and whatnot. But I like You're the DD13 the, for the weight saving. You're loaded all the time, you said? Uh, uh, yeah, just you know, 75 plus percent of the time. Yeah. And and where do you run? Uh, I'm based in the Texas Panhandle, but I run a 700 mile radius. So I run up into Wyoming. I run into the mountains of Colorado, New Mexico. And and your speed? But, uh, speed 65 is my preferred speed. But on do the you flat. stay there, or do you want the flexibility to go faster than that? No, well, yeah, 70 tops. And I do a lot of 60 mile an hour when I can, but I'm in a regional deal. Sometimes it does matter. I need to go a little faster, but I, I would like to be able to cruise uh, at 65 on the flat. With that, I'd either go with the uh, 216, if you're doing a 6x4 direct, or the 264 with the overdrive if you wanted a little bit more flexibility to be able to go faster when you needed it. 264, okay. Yeah, I would like to, I, I like the overdrive. Um, how, I, I like the idea that Joel talks about right, being having three gears. Does that does that give you three, three pretty efficient uh, gears? Or, or are you two and a half? <laughs> okay, it's two and a half. Yeah. Okay. It's not quite to get into that third gear, but the yeah. thirteen doesn't mind spinning just a little bit quicker than the fifteen liter. So. And that, it's making its horsepower down low, uh, down low as well, right? Uh, not as low as what Joel's talking, but it, it works. And like Joel was saying the other day, sort of bridges halfway so, between as far down as Joel went. Yeah. But with the flip, so we're talking about wider uh, RPM range. Yeah. We're talking about kind of 1100 cruising for that DD 13 would be it's, pretty nice. It's, it's six with the two sixty four, it'd be about 1150 when you were cruising 65. Yeah. Okay. Then when you drop well, down I, one gear, you'd have all the pulling power you'd need. Yeah. Well, I, I want to, 
yeah, one of ahead, the Jill. things about uh, about the Detroit is it does make horsepower a little higher in the range. So Henry's correct. When you downshift the 264 with the Detroit, you're still going to be on the power curve. Whereas I downshift the 264 with a Volvo, I'm kind of off the power curve. And that's why the Volvo needs to be a little more aggressive than the Detroit. Um, you know, it, it, as I mentioned before, Detroit done a really nice job at straddling the fence on downsped and traditional. They, they have a nice niche where they can run right in between there. And it, it works well for a lot of people. Um, you know, it, it's not as big a jump as, you know, coming out of a traditional truck, trying to go into a Volvo with what I have at 216 overdrive where, you know, people just completely lose their mind on that. Um, oh, yeah. you know, Freightliner, <laughs> Freightliner, Freightliner's got a really nice niche there going on, especially with the 13 liter where they can really straddle the fence. Like Henry said, it will spin a little faster without the efficiency loss because you have less displacement, less friction. So it's a little more comfortable at higher RPM, lighter weight crankshaft, lighter weight connecting rods. Um, it, it, it definitely is not going to run down where I'm at. I, I think Henry hit it right on the head two and a half gears there. Um, that's, that's what you're looking at. Not quite the reduction in the transmission, but should still be plenty for what you want to use it for. Yeah. Well, we were talking about it a couple of days ago, uh, uh, on the power hour, but since then I took this over to Las Cruces and, uh, you know, there's a big hill there going east and west out, out and into Las Cruces coming in from the east. Uh, you know, sure enough, mountain grade there for six or seven miles, 107 degrees going up that thing and just had no problem staying cool. I, I'm completely impressed with, with how this Good. DD-13, I, I, that, I, that's, 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 that, and that's maxed out loaded, you know, 84,000 uh, going up that thing. So I was really impressed with the engine okay. when I saw it. I liked the design. I liked the 13 liter. I was optimistic and I, over the last couple of years, I've almost stopped talking about it. The, the owner operators just aren't buying I, this engine. I don't know why, Henry, oh, why, uh, why, why would you even run a DD-15 if you, I mean, especially well, a, a a, dr- a freight operation where you're, I mean, heck, we're heavy and we're running these things. So it depends. So what what happened with the 15, the 15 with their high compression ratio and all, they generally run less turbo boost than many other engines. So it's like a low stress unit. Uh, the 15 liter, because of resale, like what Kevin was talking about earlier, uh, traditionally has gotten all the technology before the 13 liter. As a matter of fact, the 13 liter just moved into Gen 5 along with the 15. So that's part of the reason sometimes the 15 has an edge on it, then the 13 catches up. It's sort of like the tires we were talking about earlier. But the 15 always gets it first, then the 13, then in the 16. Uh, okay. Right. I, I think it's a lot of the displacement thing is – Look, in the in the United States, we've kind of been, I don't know if we're brainwashed we or are. we just believe whatever we want to believe, we, we but, still but talk it's just about, been bigger is always better. We still talk you about know, that blocks. That's just the way it's been. Sure, right, <laughs> it, it, right. Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. We, we, we just believe, for whatever reason, bigger is better. Um, and that's rarely the case when you, you just can't look at one aspect of a powertrain and go, well, it's got more displacement. It, it's going to last longer and pull better. It, it, it doesn't work that way. No. Nope. Um, and Europe is a, it can. Europe is a very, not it, it can. You're exactly right. So in Europe, uh, they have, they're on grade more often. They typically pull more weight than what we do. And predominantly they run 13 liter engines. Now they have, 750 horsepower, 16 liter engines over there. But, you know, the guys only buy them when the duty cycle really dictates it. And over here, we would buy that to pull 10,000 pounds for whatever reason. I, you know, I don't understand why, but we do stuff like that. We go out and we have an engine tuned to 750 horsepower and we're pulling on average 65,000 pounds gross combination vehicle weight. You really can't make an argument for that. But we do it, and and we've yeah. done it for decades, and so it's that's where the the OEMs kind of play that they have to. Because hey, let me jump in here again before I lose before I lose my reception. 
Joel, the same operation with your Volvo. What, what, what I look for in a turbo compound and a VG, because I can't find a, I can't find a turbo compound. You won't find a, a, an I Torque spec on the market yet, but that's what you would Thanks. you'd look for is the I Torque spec. What I'm running. And VGT, so, I think, um, as aggressive you can get as 247. Here's something interesting. Overdrive. Why, when we're talking about this and we're talking about the 15 and the 13, and it, why don't we throw in the Volvo? What size is the Volvo engine? Oh, it's 13. I know. Yep. <laughs> but so why do we? Yep. And the, the most popular engine of all time was 12.7. But somehow, if we ever talked about a Cat C12, now we talk about a 13 liter, you know, Detroit. We talk like well, they're small. Let me, let, but they're, why do we do well, that? Well, let's 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 talk about that. Well, let me let me explain why we do that. So the perception in the United States has always been bigger is better. In Europe, that was never the case. So when we designed smaller displacement engines over here, like the 3176 C10 C12. Uh, we had lightweight crankshafts, lightweight connecting rods, lightweight blocks, lightweight heads. It was all about weight, and they made them very lightweight. The M11 Cummins is another example. They made them very lightweight. In Europe, it was never about weight. It was just about the displacement. So you had heavier cranks, you know, oh, just a, a more point. durable design in that mid-range. So we got... Over here, when we started ordering, you know, 3176s and you had to overhaul them in 400,000 miles or whatever the case may be, um, we were turned off by them. And so when the Europeans brought a decent 13 liter over here, we looked at it and said, Ugh, I ain't doing I that. I, I, you know I, what I mean? The, so I, I can it, go it, back to it, the, it was crazy. Let's think about the engines, the 11 liter Detroit. Let's go all the way to 11 liter. That engine was bulletproof. It got good fuel economy. If you tuned it and had it set up right, it pulled well, lasted forever. Yep. That was an 11 liter. Yep. Uh, the, what yep. about a, a very heavy 11 uh, liter, though? Right. Very I mean, heavy for an 11 liter. You're right, it was. He heavy yeah. as most 14 liters. Yeah. So one of the generic ways that we've always, that I've learned to look at engines over the years was you just look at the the weight per cubic inch of displacement. It's a good point. And that gives you a general sense of, is this thing going to last or but, isn't it? Generally, the heavier the part in a commercial operation, the longer that part will last, regardless of what it is, in general terms. So, so Kevin, you, you said, why here in America do we think that on that bigger? Well, you know, there was kind of a movie about that not long ago, Ford versus Ferrari. You know, the 427, when they stuffed it in there and went to Le Mans. Yeah. You're right. We have had success with bigger is better. So, sometimes we have. And look, yep. my Sprinter, <laughs> a 3500, dual wheels. It's a big, heavy vehicle. It's got a three liter in it. I, you're yes. right. The Europeans uh, are good at I this. Understand. They, they pull all kinds of horsepower and <laughs> torque out of very small engines. Here's. A great example, when I graduated from high school, I had a one-ton Chevy truck with a 454, made around 235 horsepower and roughly the same amount of torque. Today, <laughs> I have a Toyota Tacoma with a 3-liter V6 that makes more horsepower and torque and gets about 12 miles a gallon better it, fuel efficiency. Yeah. You yeah, know, but I yet know. you'll still have guys going, well, it ain't a big block. Well, I'm glad it's not. <laughs> I you know. know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, right. the hey, idea well, that there's no replacement for displacement is just ludicrous. Absolutely, especially in trucking. I, I get it. Let's, uh, Terrence, what's up? What's up, guys? This, uh, back to the radar uh, thing. I don't know. I, I, I used to run my, when I owned my own truck. I ran garbage and all. I used to run across Mount Pocono from Jersey out to Pennsylvania. And they used to, oh, coming God. down Mount Pocono, they used, they used to have these dots. They had these dots mm -hmm. out there, like a big, and, and, and they spaced them out, and they would, because there was always pileups out there. And what you would do is say, all right, you know, leave two, two spaces, you know, two dots is a good following distance. So I kind of kept that my whole driving thing. Well, when I, was, when I moved to Wisconsin, I was working for that place. We ran from Franksville, Wisconsin, down to Indiana, you know, all around Chicagoland there. We hauled beer. So we're running down 94, 294. So I, I got this truck. It was a Peterbilt. It had the radar in it. And, it. and when you first get in, it's going off. It's going I'm like, I'm not following close enough. That made me realize for the 
20 years before our way I was driving, I was, I was following too closely. And, 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 I, yep. and you know, and, 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 and I remember, remember when I said I was going, I'm going down 294 to two, and 94, I'm going to Chicago where it's four lanes of traffic, people flying all over the place. But it changed, it changed my driving pattern. Unbelievable. And I'm glad. And then, and then we had like guys that wouldn't take the truck, brand, a brand, brand new truck. I'm, I'm not taking, I'm going to stick my elbow. I was like, all right, whatever. You just got to learn the following distance. And, and then the other thing they did too is, like, what's supposed, how come you're not putting as much fuel in? And we, and we were running, we were running CNG though. I mean, it doesn't make a difference. But again, because I'm not running up someone's ass, jamming my brakes on, trying right. to get, you know, because we ran heavy. We were, we, yeah, we were running, you were at 80, 82. You know, we could run 2,000 pounds over because of the CNG. But it's, you know, and I just think that that technology is amazing. Because you can also yeah. see too, like if someone comes flying by you, you can see how fast they're going. You, you looked up in the corner and you see 101. I mean, you could, it's just, oh, yeah. the technology yeah. for that is, is phenomenal. Yeah, and the, the people that go, I got bells and whistles, I don't need no. It just it puts you right. It, it, it changed so, my driving habits. So I agree. So how hey. I always teach people to drive that, and I do a lot of that, is I tell them it's like walking a dog. It's going to see things that you don't want it to see, but you're looking out the same windshield. If you put your foot on the throttle, cancel, cruise, make some sort of a reaction, the truck says, okay, you got this. You, you don't just let the dog go after the little kid sitting in the grass next to the <laughs> sidewalk. You would curb the dog up before you got there, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's a good loyal dog, and, and that's much how this system works, and people get a grasp on it then. you got to stay a step ahead of it. So here's one of, we're going to wrap this up and we're going to move over to Twitter. You guys are joining me on Twitter today, right? Sure. Okay. Um, 9.15, so we're going to wrap this up so I have time to go switch over. Um, Here's what I'm dealing with, though. We'll see what happens with this discussion on Twitter. I'm debating somebody right now. And as soon as I put up the numbers about driver pay from Atri, he immediately said, I don't think those are right. Mm -hmm. They're way too high. There's no way that's what drivers are making. They're not taking into account new drivers. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. I think they have to be. These fleets all have new drivers. They have seasoned drivers. These are, you know, significant fleets. So if those numbers aren't right, then we can't even start to discuss this until we can at least agree on the numbers. So I said, give me some numbers that you think are right. And here's what he brought back. He brought back Department of Employment numbers, but when I look at it, it includes all drivers over 26,000 pounds, including tow truck drivers. And I said, well, that that's not a good number to be using. Well, they're CDL drivers. No. I, come on. It, it, <laughs> 26,000 yeah. pounds, that, that's when they not... When wages and benefits... Well, that's the other thing, too. The number from the Department of Employment or whoever this number is from isn't including benefits. It's just the, the wage number. The other thing we have right. to remember. Right. When you add the benefits in. And the other thing we mm-hmm. have to remember is that the more driver pay goes up, so does the tax side for the employer because it's a percentage. And we don't calculate yeah. that into this either. The, the If we say a driver makes 60 cents a mile, his Social Security comes out of that 60 cents a mile, but the carrier's Social Security comes out of the carrier's pocket, and we're not including that. Mm-hmm. So No, I, I agree. All right. I agree. So, There's a lot, a lot of things that often are, the average person just doesn't take into consideration on, on the business side of things, and that's, that's definitely one of them. So. So we'll Absolutely. we'll take this conversation over there. Maybe we can get some new voices in, and we'll we'll get some new ideas, or we'll scream at each other for an hour or two, and we'll see what happens. Um, so come on over and join us. If you're listening on the app, nothing changes. You can just keep listening on the app. We'll be back in a couple minutes. But if you want to jump in and be a part of the conversation, you do have to be on Twitter with us. Any final words, you guys? It, it might be a few minutes till I get on, Kevin. Okay, that's fine. We'll wait for you. Well, actually, we won't wait. We'll start, but yep. we'll, when you get there, jump in. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be a I'll be a couple minutes as well, but I'll be over. All right. Hopefully, I won't be late. I just have to run into the other room. Not that I couldn't <laughs> stay here, but I, it's just like I I need a shift of scenery because everything's changing. So I move from my studio over to the sunroom. So we will be back in just a couple minutes. Be safe. Be profitable. Be fit and healthy always. Do the hard work and master the journey.